people of Kona Place Center shout, shout your name with joy. Let all the people of Hey, it's always good to be in the house of the Lord. The house is full today. Just look around your room. I'm sure your living room is full. Uh, when I asked the Lord earlier this week about what he wanted me to preach today, he said faith. And the first scripture that came to my mind when he said faith is 1 Corinthians 16 and 13. Now, I primarily preach out of the New King James Version. So 1 Corinthians 16 and 13. Verse 13 says, watch. First thing he said is, watch. Second thing he said is, stand fast in faith. And he said, be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. And as I was thinking about that, another verse came quickly to mind. 2 Timothy 3 and 1. But know this. That in last days, in the last days, that's us, perilous times will come. We are living in perilous times. Therefore, the word of the Lord for us today is watch. And of course, Habakkuk 2 and 1 talks about that. So Habakkuk 2 and 1, I will stand my watch. I will set myself on the ramport. I, you know, we all have an appointed watch to stand. We all have an appointment with the King of Kings and with the Lord of Lords. And our appointment is to watch and see what he would have to say. Now, there's a place for talking to God, but this is the place for listening to God. See, this is the place where we get the battle plan. This is the place where we get the instructions, the commands. This is the place where we get the victory. And what I and then he says, and what I will answer when I am corrected. Now, I don't know about you, but my wife's got about a hundred ideas a minute on what we should do. I got a few myself. I'm sure you have a five thousand or two. And this is not the time to go to the Lord and say, here's what I think. This is the time that we go to the Lord and find out what he thinks. And whatever he thinks we should do, let, let's abandon our ideas in favor of whatever the Lord's ideas are. Verse 4, he says, Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Now, in context of this scripture, the proud is the self-reliant. The proud's the one that has the ideas that wants God to do their ideas. The proud is the one that's saying, I got this. And the one that is uh, humble, which would be the opposite of proud, is the one that is reliant on God. The one that is looking for God's ideas. The ones that, that's expecting God to do something. So, the word of the Lord starts off with watch, stand your watch. The word of the Lord continues for us today with stand fast in faith. Colossians 2 and 4. Colossians 2 and 4 says, Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. There are deceivers out there saying all kinds of stuff. It is, it's just next to impossible to know who to believe about anything at this point. In our daily Bible reading yesterday, and Terry talked about it, I hope you're doing your daily Bible reading. In our daily Bible reading yesterday, Peter talked about false prophets and false teachers. Peter identified five traits of the false teacher. The first trait was the rejection of coming judgment. Interesting. There are people out there that says that everybody's going to get saved. That's a rejection of coming judgment. There's that people out there say, it doesn't matter, man. You can just do whatever you want, and, you know, God's good. He's going to save you anyway. That's a rejection of coming judgment. The Bible's really clear that there is a coming judgment. The second trait of the false teacher is uh, sexual immorality, whether they personally are sexually immoral or whether they're saying it's okay to be sexually immoral. It is not okay to be sexually immoral. The third trait is greed. Th this one hurts my heart the most, I think. 
that people would be into preaching the word for money, for self gain. And it just hurts my heart because God is so good. He blesses us with so much. But that's not the purpose for being a Christian. That's not the purpose for preaching the gospel. The purpose for preaching the gospel is to reach the people that God loves and wants to bring in his kingdom. So the fourth trait is carnality or fleshliness. And man, that is everywhere these days, isn't it? And the fifth trait is the rejection of godly authority. I find this interesting. You realize that God has placed authority in your life, spiritual authority. He's placed political authority in your life. He's placed authority in the community, on the road, at the grocery store. And we cannot reject godly authority. That's a sign of a false teacher. Now, Peter clearly states that these false teachers were present in the church at the time of his writing. And he also clearly states that they will be present in the church in our time. So do not be deceived. And the question is how? Well, first of all, watch. And second of all, stand fast in faith. Verse 5, he says, For though I am absent in the flesh... Yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. You see, standing fast in faith, here's a couple of keys to let you know if you are. First of all, there's order in your life and not chaos. God is the God of order, not chaos or confusion. And the second is this steadfastness that no matter what's going on, up or down, We were looking at the levels on the audio before the service, and they go up and down, up and down, up and down. And whether it's up or down, in or out, whatever is going on, there is this rock-solid faith in Jesus, this rock-solid expectation that Jesus is who he says he is. There is this rock-solid relationship that we have with Jesus on a daily basis. Verse 6. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord. Have you received Jesus? If you have, walk in him. Walk with Jesus. You see, this is the real goal to me, is just to walk with Jesus. Now, Jesus doesn't go in a straight line, because if he did, then we wouldn't need directions. He kind of zigs and zags here and there. And that way... He knows that if we're going to walk with him, that we have to follow hard after him. One of my favorite scriptures is said that Jesus set his face as a flint. That's old King James. But the idea is he set himself and he didn't allow anything to move him off of his path. We need to set ourselves on Jesus and not allow anything to get us off the path of following Jesus. Verse 7, rooted and built up in him. You see, he is our identity. He is our resource. He is our reward. He is our protector. He is our healer. He is our savior. We need to be rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. And see, this is an interesting concept. Stand fast in faith. Be established in faith. This means that faith This relationship with Jesus, because that's what faith is, needs to be the focal point of our lives. It needs to be in first place. He says, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught. I was at a Bob meeting uh, a while back, and uh, Mario and Ivan, who I think are just great men of God, uh, I think they both have an ability to preach the word with power and authority. They they gave me the best compliment anybody could ever give me. They said that the people of this church have been taught how to walk with Jesus. They've been taught how to walk in faith. They know how to read their word. They know how to hear from God. They know how to do it. And see, our church isn't about a personality or two. Our church is about walking with Jesus. He said, be established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. And and thanksgiving is always key in everything. Thank you, Jesus. You know, 
without it becoming just the rote thing, thank you, Jesus, I, I would want to say thank you, Jesus, about a million times in a day and, and really be focused on it because thanksgiving releases the miraculous in our life. So the word for, uh, of the Lord for us today is watch, stand fast in faith, and then be brave, be strong. Now, Terry's already read this. It amuses me. Ephesians 6 and 10. Ephesians 6 and 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. What does that mean, be strong in the Lord? That means have your trust, your reliance, and your obedience focused on Jesus. That means have that daily, ongoing, moment-by-moment relationship with Him. That means the seven pillars operating in full capacity. Be strong in the Lord. And then he says something really interesting. Be strong in the power of his might. We are living in perilous times. And I want to tell you, stuff's going to happen that the world is not going to have any answers for. But we have the answers. You have the Holy Spirit. You have gifts of the Spirit. And what he's saying here is that we need to be strong in allowing the Holy Spirit to flow through us and impact the lives of people around us. We need to be strong in giving the answer of Jesus to all the problems that the world doesn't have any solutions for. We need to be strong in the power of God being released, not just into our life, but through our lives to the people around us. 1 Corinthians 1 and 18 tells us it's that the message of the cross, and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, the cross, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. See, we need to be strong in the Word. We need to be strong in the message of the cross. We need to speak the Word over situations and release the power of God into situations that the world has no answers for. Ephesians 6 and 11. He says, put on the whole armor of God. We need the whole counsel of God. We need all the Word. We need everything that God has for us. I was thinking about this this week, and I was thinking, why wouldn't you want everything that God has for you? Whatever it is. If God wants something for you, it must be great. It must be good. It must help in some way. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Stand what? Stand fast in faith. Stand in being courageous, brave, strong, stand against the schemes or the wiles of the devil. Verse 13, therefore take up the whole armor of God. You see, we need everything that God's handing out that we may be able to stand in the evil day. And we've got to stand in faith, but it takes what? It takes courage. It takes strength. Uh, uh, Joshua is one of my favorite uh, Old Testament characters. In Joshua chapter 1, God told him, hey, meditate in the Word day and night. Be strong and courageous. And if we will do that, if we will be people of the Word that speak the Word, if we will do so uh, in courage and bravery and strength, according to uh, what God said to Joshua, then we'll be prosperous and successful. God wants to release His power in an ever greater degree through you, the people of Kona Faith Center, into this community, bringing answers, bringing solutions where there aren't any. Verse 14, stand therefore. See, we've got to stand no matter what's going on. We've got to speak the Word no matter what's going on. We've got to stand based upon the Word of God, what God says, and not what we see with our natural eyes. We've got to stand based upon what the Word of God says and not what we see in the media. We've got to stand on the Word of God. We've got to speak it forth. So what is the Word of the Lord today? Watch. Stand fast in faith. Be brave be strong. And the last part of the word of the Lord for us today is let all that you do be done with love. Mark 12 and 29. Mark 12 and 29. Jesus answered and said, 
the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Kona Faith Center, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then verse 30, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Now, love, especially as it's talked about here, is not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's not an act of your will. It's a relationship. It's a spiritual relationship. It's a commitment to this God that we serve of everything that we are, of everything that we have. And the really cool thing about this commitment is he's making the same commitment to us. Everything that he is, everything that he has. He says the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There are no other commandments greater than these. Of course, in John 15, Jesus took it to a whole nother level, and he said, I've told you you need to love others as yourself, but now I'm telling you, you need to love people the way I loved you. Whoa. I want to make sure that you understand that whatever we're doing, whether it's preaching the gospel, whether it's laying hands on the sick, whether it's giving, whether it's being, whether it's listening, our heart motivation has to be love for God, love for God's people. And the way we love God is by loving the people that God sends our way. So the word of the Lord to us today is watch. Stand fast in faith. Be brave. Be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. 2 Corinthians 1 and 18. 2 Corinthians 1 and 18. But as God is faithful, I, you know, are there any more powerful words in the Bible than this? God is faithful. Whatever God has promised, he'll do. Whatever he has said, he will come through on. God is faithful. In another place, it says that even when we're not faithful, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. But as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is preached among you by us, is not yes and no, but in him is yes. For all the promises of God. And this is a key thought, all the promises of God. See, we've got to stand our watch and get some of those promises. We, we need promises for our families. We need promises for our health. We need promises for our provision. We need promises for our neighbors. We need promises for our community. We need promises for our nation. And if we can get a promise from God, then all of the promises of God in Jesus are yes, and in Jesus they are amen, so be it done. To the glory of God through us. Verse 21, now he who establishes us with you in Christ has anointed us. Do you recognize that you are the anointed? What does that mean? That means the anointing, the power of God, Old Testament definition, the burden lifting, yoke destroying power of God rests on you in the person of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is the anointing. Now, he who has established us in Jesus is the same God that has anointed us with the Holy Spirit and power. Acts 1.8, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and power will come upon you. You see, we need to be the people of God. We need, we need to stand up. We need to stand fast in faith and be strong, be brave, and in love, allow the power of God to flow out of us to the people that don't have any solutions. Verse 22, he has also sealed us and given us the Holy Spirit in our heart as a guarantee. This is a great, I mean, this is a great scripture because the Holy Spirit's the guarantee. You got the Holy Spirit in you? Ha, ka, so, shan, ba, ha, te, he. That's the guarantee that all of his promises, all of them, or yes and amen. So it's not about all the promises. It's about what promises do you have? What promises have you received 
from God. Well, any promise that you've received from God, the Holy Spirit's the guarantee that it's a done deal. Verse 24. He says something really interesting here. He says, not that we have dominion over your faith. See, I'm not trying to um, lord it over you. I'm not trying to make you do something you don't want to do. I, I don't have control of your faith. You do. I only have control of my faith. Not that we have dominion over your faith, but we are fellow workers for your joy. And I want to tell you the truth. Nothing brings greater joy to Pastor Terry and me than you guys living by faith and being blessed and being prosperous and reaching people and seeing the power of God flow through and touch people around you. Nothing brings us greater joy. Yeah. And then he says it's for by faith that you stand. And so faith in this context is the key thing. And once again, faith is, at its core, a relationship with Jesus. 2 Corinthians 13 and 4. 2 Corinthians 13 and 4. It says, For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. Who are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus. Jesus was crucified in weakness, yet Jesus lives by the power of God. Okay, pay attention. This is really good. We also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God. Oh, brothers and sisters, I want to tell you that when we are weak, he is strong. I want to tell you that God has power that he's wanting to pour out through the people of Kona Faith Center into this community. And it doesn't matter whether, you know, you've done all seven pillars, whether you prayed, read, whatever. It doesn't matter how strong in the Lord you are. Because it says here, when we're weak, ho! Oh, when we're weak, then we're strong. When we're weak, then the power of God is poured out through us. Verse 5, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Uh-oh. Test yourselves. Uh-oh. Why? Why is he saying this? Because, see, faith is the key element here. Faith is the element for everything that God wants to do in this life. His grace is everything, and we access his grace by faith. See, God wants our faith to grow, to increase, to rise up, so that we can be that conduit for his power in every situation. Your situation, the situation of the people around you. So examine yourself. Are you in faith? Test yourselves. Are you in faith? Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. Now, now look it. The Holy Spirit's the guarantee, so all you have to do is haka sambo shatande. But I want to give you another one that will kind of help you with this test your faith stuff. I, I love worship. Um, I, I love the worship songs our people are writing. They're amazing to me. Our definition for worship is the direct acknowledgement to God of his nature, of his character, of his ways, and of his claims. Here's the way to find out the level of faith that you have, the level of relationship you have with your God, is how long you can just worship the Lord without having to repeat yourself. Lord, you are so good. That's great. Lord, you are mighty. That's better. Lord, you are loving, you are kind, you are merciful, you are the almighty one, you are the all-knowing one, you are the omniscient one, you are beautiful, you are majestic, you are magnificent. Yes. And, and see, if you can do that for a couple of minutes without repeating yourself, that's an indicator right there that your relationship with Jesus is pretty strong, that your faith is pretty strong. Now, there's other ways to test, and here's the, here's the thing that I'm trying to say is let's not fall into guilt or shame or condemnation 
but let's apply ourselves, let's practice, let's grow in faith. Our community needs our faith. Colossians 1 and 21. And you, ha, that means me too, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. Oh, Lord Jesus. I, I was talking to some guy, and he was saying how tough his life was, and I said, well, I get it. And I told him my little story, and he says, well, I guess your life was tougher than my life. You know what? I, I have sinned every sin known to man plus a few more. I was alienated. I was an enemy by the wicked works of myself. It wasn't the devil's fault. It wasn't my mom and dad's fault. It wasn't the government's fault. It was my fault. They were my wicked works. And yet, now he has reconciled me. Now he has brought me to himself. Now he has forgiven me in the body of his flesh through death. And in doing so, he presents me and you holy and blameless above reproach in his sight, if indeed. Now, I wish this wasn't in here, but it's in here. If indeed. I love that, indeed. How many of you said, indeed, someplace this week? My uncle used to say it all the time. Terry and I watch some English stuff, and they're always indeeding. It's a wonderful word. If, indeed, you continue in the faith. You see, just because you had faith this week, it's good. But this week's faith don't take care of next week's faith. Last week's faith don't take care of this week's faith. See, we've got to continue in faith, grounded and steadfast in faith in our relationship with Jesus, and we cannot be moved away from the hope of the gospel. Now, I preached about what the gospel was a couple of Sundays ago. We can't be moved away from that. We can't allow whoever, whatever, whatever they're saying to move us away from the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Second Thessalonians 1. Therefore, we also pray always for you. Terry and I are always praying for you guys. And here's the primary thing that we pray, that our God would count you worthy of this calling. Yeah, we pray for your prosperity. We pray for your success. We pray for your relationships. We pray for your health. But we pray that God would count you worthy of this high call of God that's on your life. And we pray that God would fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power in you. Now I want you to think about that with me. Fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness. How good is God? God is so good. He is so unlimited in his goodness I love Psalms that tells us his goodness follows us all the day of our lives. Now, I don't know how much of his goodness you've experienced, but according to this verse, he's got an amount of goodness that he wants you to experience, and it brings him good pleasure to do so. How do we experience this goodness? We've got to press in in faith. It's the only way to receive it. The work of faith with power. See, it takes the power of God to receive all that he has for us. 1 Timothy 6 and 11. 1 Timothy 6 and 11. But you, O man of God. Ha! Of course, Paul's writing to Timothy here. But I think in context I could say, but you, people of Kona Faith Center, people of God, pursue righteousness, pursue godliness, pursue faith, pursue love, Pursue patience. Pursue gentleness. Now, that doesn't mean that you can pursue them today and that's good enough. That means a continually, daily pursuit of those qualities, which happen to be the very character qualities of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if we are in passionate pursuit of him, if we are in passionate pursuit of being like him, of reflecting him, of representing him, if we are in passionate pursuit of these things, then all of God's goodness 
is made available to us. And then he says something really interesting. Fight the good fight of faith. You see, we're in a real fight. We're in a real fight. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were called. Now, once again, I, I read something interesting in my, uh, one of my commentaries this week. And the guys on the other side of the fence theologically from me. Um, but he said that whichever side of the theological f fence you're on, the evidence of a real Christian life, Christian life is perseverance. I found that a really interesting statement. Because his side of the fence says, you know, if you're saved, then you can't not be saved. You can't lose your salvation in any way, shape, or form. And yet he still says that from that side of the fence, it still means he who perseveres to the end shall be saved. You see, and that's what we have to do. We have to fight the good fight of faith. How often? Every day. Every day we've got to be fighting that good fight of faith. Every day we have to lay hold of the eternal life that has been given to us in the person of Jesus Christ and the person of the Holy Spirit. Every day we've got to say no to the things of this world so we can say yes to the things of God. 1 Peter 5 and 5. 1 Peter 5 and 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Oh, boy, that, I'm sure that just went over really well. Everybody loves to submit, right? Wrong. I, I think that in our current language, the word defer might make it a little more palatable for most people. Look at everybody that is walking with the Lord. God's put somebody in your life to oversee you, to help you. Everybody. And as a pastor, I've got people that I allow to speak into my life. And I don't think you ever come to the place where you are mature enough or have it all worked out to where you don't need people speaking into your life. So younger people, defer to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive or all of you defer to one another. I, I want to tell you, I think that we have to be really careful here and not, um, I think we have to be really careful here to be open to people of like precious faith. Uh, being open to people at Kona Faith Center that are challenging us to grow to the next level. He says, and be clothed with humility. Of course, my definition for humility is properly placed confidence. And see, I, I love that little, uh, it's, it's in the Psalms someplace, it's in the New Testament someplace. We have no confidence in the flesh. Our confidence is in the Spirit. Thank you, Lord. So, yes, all of you be submissive to one another and clothed with humility, for God resists the proud. Once again, this is the self-reliant. This is the one that's not looking for anybody to help them. This is the one that thinks they got all the answers. But he gives grace to the humble. Isn't that an interesting statement? Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. In other words, get your confidence totally placed in God. That he, what? May exalt you, may lift you up in due time. How do we do that? We do that by casting all our care upon him. Now, this is really easy to say, but it's not so easy to do when you're in the midst of the battle. But remember, we're to fight the good fight of faith. And I don't care what it is. And there's something it every day. We have got to learn how to take it and cast it on the Lord knowing that he cares for us, knowing that he's going to take care of it, knowing that the attack of the enemy is just an attack on our faith. He says, in verse 8, be sober. That means just live a self-controlled life. Be vigilant. That just means pay attention. Don't fall asleep. Because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith. See, once again, the way we resist the devil, James 4 and 7, is we submit ourselves to God and the authority of his word. Then we have what it takes to resist the devil. And we can resist him steadfast in faith. 
It says, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Hey, whatever you're going through, you're not the only one. That's all he's saying. Verse 10, but to me, the God of all grace, and here we go. Oh, man, here we go. Not just grace, which is everything, but all grace, which is everything times everything times everything, I guess. Maybe Cassie could work out one of those little formulas for you, um, you know, grace to the hundredth power or something. I don't know. The God of all grace, the God of everything, who has called us by his eternal glory in Christ Jesus. He says, after you have suffered a while. Say what? You, you know, I think we have to look at this the way a parent looks at a child. You know, children need to learn stuff, right? And nobody gets it right the first time, and we need to let people make their own mistakes and learn from them, because unfortunately, most of us learn more from our mistakes than from our successes. And I think that's all that's going on here, is God is trying to get us to learn, trying to get us to grow, and remember that the evidence of being a Christian is perseverance. So after you've suffered a while, he will perfect you or mature you. After you have persevered for a while, he will establish you. After you have persevered for a while, he will strengthen you. After you have persevered for a while, he will settle you. So the word of the Lord for today is watch, stand fast in faith, be brave, be strong, let all that you do be done with love. So I just want to get practical for a minute because I've been talking about stuff that, yeah, it sounds good, it's easy to say, but how do you do it? Let's turn to Hebrews 11 and 1. We're going to start there. It says Hebrews 11 and 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The word translated hope means confident expectation. Now faith is the substance of things confidently expected, the evidence of things not seen. The key to faith can be found in this confident expectation. Confident expectation is not an emotion, so you can't work it up, you can't pump it up. Confident expectation is not an intellectual process, so you can't reason it out or logic it out. Confident expectation is a relational component that is worked out in the spirit realm. God is relationship-oriented, not performance-oriented. Thank you, Jesus, forevermore. Therefore, confident expectation and faith itself are relationship-based. See, it's only through real relationship with the Lord that confident expectation and therefore faith can arise. I read a blog that said that um, it was a guy writing, and he was trying to address why are there more women in church than men in North America. And he was saying that the church in North America has focused on the relationship, you know, the marriage relationship side of the equation, almost to the exclusion of the warrior side of the, of the equation. I want to tell you guys, you, you can't be a successful warrior, you can't win any victories, you can't win any battles if you don't have the relationship with Jesus because that's how it all works in the first place. <clears throat> and it's only through real relationship with Jesus that confident expectation and faith can arise. Romans 4, verse 11. Romans 4 and 11. It says, and Abraham received the sign of circumcision. What was that? Circumcision was the sign of the blood covenant between God and Abram. It says it was a seal of righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised. In other words, God made the covenant with Abraham before he got circumcised. So circumcision isn't anything. It's just the sign of the covenant that God and Abraham had. And it says that this seal of righteousness, of faith, he had that, that he might be the father of all those who believe. 
and we used to sing a song, we still do sometimes, Father Abraham had many sons. I am one of them, and so are you, something like that. And this is what he's saying, that Father Abraham is the father of all those who believe. Though they are uncircumcised, I'm not circumcised, I'm not Jewish, but Abraham is still my father because I believe. And he says that the reason that God made Abraham the father of all, both the circumcised and the uncircumcised, is so that the righteousness that was accredited or imputed to Abraham's count, account could be credited or imputed to our account whether we're circumcised or uncircumcised. And of course, this righteousness came through relationship and not something that Abraham did. Verse 12, and he says, And the father of circumcision to those who are not only of the circumcision, but, also, but who also walk in the steps of faith. And I love this uh, translation, the steps of faith. It says there's some steps of faith. And I want to be clear here, there may be steps of faith, but there's no formula. If you turn this into a formula, if you turn this into a performance thing, you're just completely missing the point. There is no formula because faith is a relationship. Now, faith is not an emotion. Faith is not a logic problem. Verse 16, therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace. You see, God wants to extend grace to you, which is everything, and he only does that through relationship with you, faith. See, faith is dependent on grace. Or the way Romans 5 and 2 says it, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Romans 4 and 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, not only to those who are of the law, that's the Jewish people, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. That's the non-Jewish people. That's us. Who is the father of us all. Verse 17, As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. Now we gloss over this, but I want to stop here for a minute. In Abraham's case, Abraham's the example here, here's the impossible promise. The impossible promise. And my question to you, what is the impossible promise in your case? What's the impossible thing that God has promised you? Is it something simple like build some buildings debt-free? Or is it a little more difficult like healing and health for you and yours? Or is it something almost impossible, like your entire family doing the 180 and serving Jesus with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their strength? You see, this is where faith starts. Where? With the promise given by God. Now, it's, it's got to be specific. It's got to be to you personally. And see, receiving a promise is not asking for the promise. We've got to stand our watch. We've got to find out what God wants. God's not able to get obligated to do anything that he has not promised you personally. And I just want to challenge you to receive what God wants to give to you. Believe me, whatever God wants to give to you, you're going to want it. You're going to want it. And remember that all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus. Verse 17, as it is written, I made you a father of many nations. The promise, what is it? In the presence of him whom he believed God. You see, we've got to get the promises from God in his presence. We've got to watch. We've got to stand our watch. We've got to come before him. We've got to listen. We've got to stand fast in faith when he does promise us something. Because the promises of God are impossible. If you could do it by yourself, that ain't God. God only promises things that only you and him together can do. So what's the word today? We've got to watch, and then we've got to stand fast in faith. We've got to watch to receive the promise. Now the word believe here, it's not an emotional response. So you can't pump it up. 
The word here is not a logical response, so you can't get your formulas and do your steps and reason it out. The word believe here is a spiritual response. This word believe is based upon a relationship with God who is a spirit. God who gives life to the dead. Got something dead in your life? God can give life to it. This God that we serve gives life to the dead. And he calls those things which do not exist as though they did. What is the impossible promise? You've got to receive it. You've got to get it. And then you've got to stand fast in faith because he can give life to dead things. He can call things that do not exist into existence. This God we serve, he is able. There's nothing that's impossible for God. Therefore... There is nothing that is impossible for those who stand in his presence if he says it. What's his promise to you? Man, it's done. It's solid. If God says it, take it. Stand fast in faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Verse 18, who in contrary to hope, in hope believe so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Now listen, Abraham had a confident expectation. The confident expectation wasn't in himself. He, his body was dead. Ha! The God we serve gives life to the dead. Ho! Chew on that for a minute. Abraham had a confident expectation, not in himself. His confident expectation wasn't even in the promise that he had received. His confident expectation was in the God who made the promise. And this is the key. Verse 19. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body, already dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Abraham did not consider the natural circumstances. We cannot consider the natural circumstances. God is supernatural. God is able to suspend the laws of nature, the nature that he made. God is not limited by nature. God is not limited by natural circumstances. God is unlimited. Verse 20. Abraham did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. In other words, Abraham's experience with God, Abraham's relationship with God was so powerful, was so supernatural, that it never occurred to Abraham that God would do anything except what God had promised. How about you? And, and boys, i got to tell you, I want to call you to be warriors in this great end-time battle. I want to call you to be mighty men of valor, warriors. But it takes a relationship, a real relationship with God to have the strength, to have the power, to have the battle plan to win the victory. Abraham had this experience with God. Abraham had this relationship with God. It was so powerful, it was so supernatural, that he never considered any other possibility. How about you? I want your relationship to grow with Jesus. Why? Because at some point, you will not consider any other possibility than whatever God has promised he will be faithful to fulfill. And this is what we're going to need in the times we're living in. These are perilous times. Abraham, verse 20, did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strengthened in faith. My current definition of faith is trust God, rely on God, obey God. So how do you strengthen trust? There's only one way. You've got to spend time with people. You've got to be open with them while you're spending time with them. The best trust and intimacy builder I have found for strengthening marriage relationships is daily Bible reading. Nothing works even close to that well in strengthening trust and intimacy in a marriage relationship. You see, I build my trust in God by digging deeper into his word daily. 
And I've challenged some of the boys to start digging deeper, and a couple of them have. I want to tell you, if you will dig deeper into God's Word, you will increase your trust. You will grow your trust. You will grow your intimacy with Him. So trust God. Rely on God. How do you strengthen your reliance on God? This is a tough one. And there's just no easy way around it. Don't help. Stay out of the kitchen. Period. God needs your help. He'll ask, and he won't. You've you got to trust him. You've got to let him do it. You've got to rely on him to make whatever it is happen. Oh, yeah. And all of us like to get our fingers into the pie. All of us like to get into the kitchen. All of us like to help God out. And when we do, all we do is prolong the process. So don't help him. Stay out of the kitchen. How do you strengthen your obedience to God, which is the third part? Practice. There's no other way. I'm currently practicing obedience by trying to stop between each task to acknowledge God and ask him which task I should do next. Now, I say practice. Where I'm currently at with this would be similar to where I'm currently at trying to learn a new song on the guitar or a new technique. It sure don't sound anything like what the song's supposed to be or the technique's supposed to be, but I'm not going to give up. I'm going to slow it down until I can play it, and I'm just going to keep practicing until I can get it up to speed that it sounds right and I can do it easily enough that I can do it anytime. And we got to do the same thing with obedience. We got to practice until we get it. And we got to practice it slow, and then we got to practice it medium, and then we got to practice it at speed. And as soon as we have it, as soon as we're confident, as soon as it's easy to be obedient in this area, then we got to move on to the next one. Just like I got to move on to the next song. So what? I can play one song. I'm supposed to be able to play at least 10 songs. Got some practice to do. Let me tell you all about it. Verse 20 Abraham did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Now, I see this in several ways. Praise and worship is a natural, spiritual strengthener. Now, praise and worship, you don't need the band. We are so blessed in this church. We have such a great worship team. They write great songs. But you don't need them to praise God on your own. You don't need them to worship God on your own. You don't need to play an instrument to praise God. You don't even need to sing well to praise God. I, I, I remember when we had a parrot, and one day I was listening to him sing, and it was so bad, I just thought, where did he learn that? And then I realized he was mimicking me. It was horrible. I, I mean, I couldn't hardly listen to it. It was so bad, yet God listened to it. Why? Because my singing wasn't about my pickup truck, my dog, my bird, the six-pack of beer that I just drank. My songs were all about praising Jesus, worshiping God. Praise and worship, man, it's key. It is key to strengthen our spirit. Something that goes right along with praise and worship, and that's thanksgiving. I, I tried to every week have some you know, a Thanksgiving day where I just thank God for all the things I see and do every day. I try to thank him for everything I do every day, but I, I want special days that are just days of giving thanks because it's a spiritual strengthener. Third way I see this is manifesting his character and nature. This is how we glorify God. It's actually the goal of being a Christian, and the more I act like Jesus... The more I imitate Jesus, the more I represent Jesus, the more I reflect Jesus to those around me, the stronger my spirit gets. Verse 21, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. See, it, this is really important, and listen to me. You and I cannot step out in faith until we have become fully convinced, fully persuaded. We cannot step out in faith until we are in the place of confident expectation. Uh, you know, 
One of the problems with all the people was I believe God and you didn't come through for me. They, they didn't work the process. They never came to the place of being fully convinced, fully persuaded. They never came to the place of confident expectation. Because if they had, the answer would be right around the corner. Now, I personally, the way God speaks to me, I know when I've reached that place of confident expectation about one of his promises, I just hear him say, done. That's all he says to me. And he only says it once, usually. Now, I still got to fight the good fight of faith because the enemy is always attacking our faith. If the enemy can get us off of our faith, if the enemy can get us out of faith, he wins. If the enemy can't get us off of our faith, if the enemy can't get us out of faith, we win. So don't step into the ring until you're prepared, until you're ready to go 15 rounds of championship boxing. Now, I know most of you guys are UFC guys, but I like 15 rounds of world championship boxing. Yeah. You can't step into the ring until you're prepared, or there's no hope. You can't step in the ring until you're ready to take a few. No guy has ever won a world championship in boxing without getting his bell rung a couple times. No guy can win a championship without getting hit and hit hard. You're going to get hit, and you're going to hit hard. you got to be ready. <clears throat> but you can't just be defensive and be ready to be the devil's punching bag. You got to get ready to give back a few. When he punches, counterpunch. You got to keep him off. And so when you step into the ring, you got to step in with a confident expectation of winning. Now, I've been talking about the steps of faith. And I don't want you to turn what I've talked about in terms of the step of faith into some kind of formula. It's not how it works. Because faith is not a formula. Faith is a process. Faith is a relationship. Now, the word of the Lord for us today is watch, stand fast in faith, be brave, be strong, let all that you do be done with love. We live in perilous times. God's got answers that the world don't have. And he's called you and me to be the people that will stand our watch, get those promises, get those answers. He's called you and me to be those people that will stand fast in our faith. He's called you and me to be the people that will be, be brave, be strong. He's called you and me to the, be the people that will do everything that we do because we love God by loving the people he sends our way. So Father, right now, I thank you for a fresh impartation of Holy Ghost power, a fresh infilling of the Holy Ghost for everybody under the sound of my voice today, a fresh ability, a fresh ability to hear the voice of God when they're standing there watch, a fresh ability to hear those promises, Lord, that you want to impart to each one of us, and then a fresh ability to stand fast in our faith, to fight the good fight of faith, to resist the devil and submit ourselves unto you, Lord God. And Father, I thank you for uh, the courage, uh, the strength to be able to not just stand fast, but to win, win the battles, win the victories. Because Lord, we need people that know how to win the battles, win the victories, to help the people in our community win the battles, win the victories. And Father, I thank you that right now that there is a fresh revelation of your love being poured out into every person's heart that's listening to this. A fresh revelation of just how high, how wide, how deep, how unlimited you love us. And Father, then a fresh ability to allow that love to flow through us to the people around us. Father, I thank you for everything that you're doing. I want to bless your people right now in Jesus' name. Be blessed, be blessed, be blessed. Love you guys. Wednesday is going to be another um, live stream event. We'll be back here a week from today for in-person services. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Shepherd, I shall not want. Jehovah is my shepherd.
Bye.